So I tell people, if you want to eat strong food, you want to eat a whole food plant-based diet. Eating foods as close to grown as possible, where you know you're getting the most kick-ass form of protein, right? All proteins originate from plants. Most people don't know that, right? And it's like the Goldilocks form of protein. It's not too high in the sulfuric containing amino acids. They're gonna promote inflammation, leach calcium from your bones, raise cholesterol levels, basically burden the dickens out of your kidneys and your liver, right? So that's one thing. You got the best form of protein as opposed to the protein that you're gonna find in red meat, chicken, fish, any of those meats, right? We now know that one of the most powerful things that you can do to create a like rock solid immune system is to start eating a whole food plant-based diet. And now the 10 times the number of cells that we have of bacteria that reside in our microbiome, we're creating a healthy microbiome and it is gonna help us defend against the litany of chronic Western diseases that are out there, inflammation, all these things. Did I mention that Rip Esselstyn is here? No, of course I didn't because I just started talking, but I'm mentioning it now, or I guess I did mention it a moment ago. Anyway, whatever, it's true. The plant strong man himself is in the house back for his second spin on the pod, his first being episode 336, basically half the canon ago, back in December of 2017. As some of you may remember, Rip and I go way back. As swimmers, we cross paths both as teens and later as college rivals. And then decades later as plant-based athlete allies. Rip, who was an NC2A All-American at the University of Texas, as well as an elite professional triathlete, was just a huge inspiration to me personally at the outset of my journey and has been and continues to be an incredible mentor, a lighthouse, a cheerleader, and just an absolutely wonderful friend. For those unfamiliar, Rip is an OG in the plant-based space, not just as this incredible athlete, At age 56, he recently broke the master's world record in the 200 meter backstroke, but also as an advocate, a public speaker, a podcaster, check out the Plant Strong podcast, uh, as well as a food entrepreneur and New York Times bestselling author. Rip's first book, Engine 2 Diet, put whole food plant-based on the map and his subsequent books, which include Plant Strong, My Beef with Meat and several others, really helps cement the benefits of this lifestyle in mainstream consciousness. We discuss the incredible mainstreaming of this movement. We talk about how to rewrite your relationship with food in the new year, what and how to eat to perform athletically and the power to positively change that lives within all of us. We also discuss his world record setting swim, what the future of the plant-based movement looks like, the story behind his brand new food company titled, of course, Plant Strong. And near the end, we even get quite a bit spiritual, a wee bit esoteric, which is personally my favorite part of this conversation. So please make sure you stick around all the way to the very end. As you'll soon discover, Rip is a good dude, a solid dude, a loyal friend, a living, bulletproof example of the benefits of the Plant Strong lifestyle. He's a passionate man devoted to simply helping people eat and live better. And I really think you're gonna dig them. To learn more about Rip, check out plantstrong.com. But right now, let us spin the wheel, shall we? Because here comes the thing, me and Rip Besselstyn, enjoy. And we're doing it. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, Rich. We're uh, we're doing this old school, <laughs> which feels appropriate. Like we're just, it's audio only. We're in the original Austin house where old school Rip Esselstyn made it all happen back in the day. So now, despite the fact that I've got this crazy studio and multiple cameras, it feels good to kind of go on the road and do it the way that I used to do it back in the day with the man himself who really has served as many of you know, as a mentor to me, as a living example of this lifestyle. And I'm excited to chop it up with you. (laughs) Well, 
Great to see you again, Rich, and welcome back to Austin. Yeah, man, I love it here. We're here in late October, the weather is unbelievable. I've been running around the lake and all the pathways around here, it's so livable. I mean, what's not to love, man? Yeah. Well, you've been here since 82? 82. 82. Yeah. I I came here to go to school at UT, University of Texas, and uh, and never left, Mm -hmm. right? But I have I have seen it grow more than we ever imagined. You know, from three hundred and forty thousand people to we're now over two two million with some of the surrounding suburbs. And uh, I read something recently: we're now the eleventh largest city in the United States. It's hard to believe. It still feels. I was just telling you, it still feels so livable, and it feels. I know there's been this crazy influx, but it does feel like it has this kind of homespun, you know, small town feel, despite the fact there's skyscrapers going up all over the place and construction everywhere. And I'm sure the traffic is <laughs> way worse than it used to be. Oh, I, I have heard yeah. that it's one of the top five worst congestive cities in the United States, uh-huh. because the, like you just said, it's got this small town feel and the infrastructure cannot support right. the the demand right now. And so we're gonna have to figure out some really smarter ways with, uh, public transportation, s- subways, light rail, all those things mm. as we grow up. And you can feel the influx over the last year of many more people oh. migrating here from Los Angeles and <laughs> New York and all yeah. the places. No, l- literally since 2000, Austin and Raleigh, North Carolina have been the two fastest growing cities in the country. Wow, yeah. but this house that we're in Net, which now serves as your office. You bought originally when you were a firefighter, right? For like pennies <laughs> on the dollar, raised your kid. Your kids mm, were born mm. here. Uh, well, I'm almost embarrassed to say it now in 2021, but yeah, I bought this in 2002 for $147,000. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I mean, and it, it's literally worth 10 times that now, at least. Yeah. And as I, I told you when I was giving you the tour, this thing was rat infested. There were holes everywhere. It was like Alice in Wonderland because uh, everything was so off level, mm-hmm. and the amount of work that I put into this house it, it was uh, it was a lot of passion. But this is where, basically, you know, I grew my family. All three kids were born in the master bedroom mm-hmm. of this house, and it's charming, and we love it. But it, six years ago, it was time to move to a little bit bigger house. Yeah. This is. 900 square feet. Right. And now it's like your man cave office. Ah. The cupboards and the shelves are covered with the new food line, the Plant Strong food line, which we're going to talk about, which is very exciting. And it gives it you, is, you know, some separation between work and family, right? Oh, yeah. If you, well, as soon as I walk through that door, it's, it's like, okay, you right. know, I'm, I'm focused in on podcasts, work, you know, whatever I got to tackle in the day related to this new kind of, you know, plant strong, you know, empire that's right. kind of we're trying to create here. Yeah, it's impressive, man. It's a very exciting time for you. Well, thanks a lot. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. I know. <laughs> so just to recap a little bit, um, and I've told this story many times on the podcast, so I don't want to belabor it, but from the very beginning, you were like this lighthouse for me when I was trying to figure out how to find a way of eating and living wherein I could thrive. I stumbled across you on Facebook and I knew your name. We weren't acquainted in person, but because we shared this history of being competitive swimmers, I I knew who you were, you swam at Texas. We had been at a lot of the same meets over the years and you were posting about this plant-based diet thing and this book that you were working on. It must've been 2007, I think around then. Seven or eight, yeah. And I just reached out to you and I was like, tell me what this is about. Like, I'm super interested. I'm at a pivotal moment in my life. And you threw me a lifeline and became like this person that helped me figure out like, because you were so much further down the path and had been living this way for so long. And because of your accomplishments as not only a swimmer, but a professional triathlete and then a firefighter, I was like, oh, this guy, like this, this is working for this guy. Like here's a guy that I can like cast my gaze upon and model, 
you know, how I'm gonna approach this new way of living. And, you know, it was huge. I mean, short of that, like, I don't know that I would be sitting here right now. And whether you know it or not, you played a huge role in that pivotal time for me and have continued to be um, a friend and a mentor in, in so many ways. So I just wanted to publicly thank you for that. But given that you have been in this game for such a long time, and I think, Engine two came out, the first book came out in 2009, right? February 25th, yeah, 2009. I mean, and, and you had been yeah. living this lifestyle for many years prior to that. It has to be unbelievably gratifying to bear witness to the mainstream adoption of this lifestyle because the differences between when I began and when your first book came out to what it looks like now, I mean, it's unbelievable. Now this, this it, it's moving at, at warp speed, truly, right? And the fact of the matter is it, it can't move fast enough, mm. right? As, especially given what we're facing right now with the, the health of this country, with the climate crisis that's afoot right now, as we're going into COP26, you know, the big conference in Glasgow, Scotland. And um, yeah, when I wrote my book, I think that maybe there were maybe 10 books that had been written mm-hmm. on, they were all plant-based, you know, Colin Campbell, you had John Robbins, Diet for a New America or Diet, yeah, Diet for a New America, Colin Campbell, obviously with mm-hmm. the China study and a handful of others. And now I feel like there's a, I mean, I'm getting people asking me to endorse their books. Like I'm getting one a week, right? Right. You know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and it is, it is phenomenal the amount of access that people have to this information, to food, to documentaries. And, um, you know, my hope is that in the next 10 years or so, we can eradicate animal agriculture from, uh, from this planet. Yeah. And when I say eradicate, I don't mean eliminate completely, but like we've done with smoking cigarettes, eradicate meaning let's get it down to where less than 20% of this of the population is is consuming this mm-hmm. way. No small problem, <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it, the way I think about it is on the one hand, there has been just this explosion of interest in this lifestyle. I think in the early days, there was a sense that, oh, this is a fad, like this is just the latest thing. It'll pass like every other fad diet, South Beach diet, and, you know, whatever, right? Um, clearly history has said otherwise, like this is here to stay. Every restaurant you go into has plant-based options. The, the you know, explosion of meat and dairy analog food products is unbelievable. Just go to any grocery store across America and quickly, you know, that's expanding across the world. And no longer are we in conversations with people who say, what is it? what is plant-based or what does vegan mean? Like they, people get it. And that's a, you know, let's just, pause for a moment and recognize that that's massive progress. Yet at the same time, the consumption of meat globally has never been higher. Mm. The incidence of chronic disease seems to be on the rise. The explosion in diabetes, type two diabetes, all of these chronic lifestyle ailments that are rooted in diet and lifestyle continue to metastasize. So it's like these parallel tracks. So. On the one hand, we can celebrate the growth of this movement. On the other hand, there's a despairing aspect of how I look at it where I go, is this making any difference? Like, how are we actually going? I mean, there's other systemic things that we have to talk about, healthcare, et cetera. We have to create environments that are conducive to healthier lifestyles, et cetera. But how do you think about, like, how do you stay optimistic and rooted in the mission? Well, I would say that I am a, the glasses, half full, not half empty kind of guy, Uh right? And so I'm always looking for the, uh, I'm very optimistic and uh, and I have a lot of hope. I mean, I have hope for for humanity. Um, I I see all the the good that's out there. I also see, you know, a lot of the bad and the ignorance, but I think so much of it is just educating people. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that I am, I mean, I spent my whole career doing. I mean, you know my path, right? I mean, mm-hmm. start- and we should probably recap that a little <laughs> bit for people because you know there's a lot of new listeners since the last time you were on the show. Yeah, 
you know, I was inspired by my father and his groundbreaking research at the Cleveland Clinic going back to 1984. And as a surgeon, he kind of decided to tackle the fact that heart disease was kind of this a making of our own cause because of what we're putting into our mouths. And, uh, and he, and I would say Dean Ornish have the most profound evidence-based research on the planet showing you can actually metabolize away these plaque formations just by changing what you eat. And so my, my father's been, you know, like you said, I, I was a, a bit of a lighthouse for you. My father's mm -hmm. been a huge right. <laughs> and I, I don't think it could me. be overstated just how radical a notion that was at the time that he was making those proclamations. Well, and everybody called him a quack. They made fun of him. Um, but my dad has always been a truth seeker and he doesn't care you know, what people think. And so he's got a pretty thick skin. And so he forged forward and you know, lo and behold, he started in 1984 and by 1991, he had some pretty profound angiographic evidence. Basically it's like a, you know, an, an X-ray of the, of the arteries where they put a dye in there, but you can actually see the before and after. And it was hugely dramatic. And he's mm -hmm. gone on since then to just do this again and again and again and again to show that it wasn't a fluke. Uh, his, his book came out in 2007, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. Uh, he's been written up in at least seven of the peer-reviewed medical literatures that are out there. Um, and he now is, uh, sits on the American College of Cardiology. He's one of the members there. And how old is he now? He's gonna, be, eight, up there. He's gonna be 88 in, right. in December. But like just a whippersnapper and like <laughs> as well, vital as ever. Has he lost a step at all or? No, and he bikes every morning and uh, he's doing fantastically well. You know, he's. Because of COVID, he's a little bit more sheltered mm -hmm. in place. You know, because of his age, he's taking some precautionary measures. Uh, but what he was able to do influenced my trajectory, my whole my whole path in life. And so when I, you know, went to University of Texas at Austin, as soon as I graduated in 1980, December '86, I um, I started eating this way. As soon as I was off the athletic. Uh, dining room table with right. the football players of steaks and bacon and eggs and all that stuff. Did uh, you do that kicking and screaming or you were compelled by your father's example? Nah. No, people always ask that. And uh, you know, I have so much respect and admiration for my father. Uh, and I have always been like one of his biggest cheerleaders. And so uh, kicking and screaming, not in the least, mm. I embraced it in a, in a big, powerful way. And I just, I was trying to figure it out, of course, for the first, you know, couple months, year. But I also decided when I graduated that I was not destined for a nine to five desk job. <laughs> it was just, and eh, made me wanna like shrivel up and, 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 and die. So uh, I always loved competition and the thrill of it and uh, just the black and whiteness of it. Like, okay, you know, there's no BS. It's just, you know, whoever crosses the finish line first, mm -hmm. There you go. You're you're the winner, and and so I decided to try my hand in triathlons, and I did that for a, a decade, right? Swimming, biking, running. I became the premier swimmer in the sport for almost a decade, and right. one of the top ten in the United States at the international distance, not the Ironman. That required required such a whole nother mentality and level of I'm going to say commitment to training. And I, always, I already was training two to <laughs> right. five hours a day. And I saw, you know, the Molinas of the world and Dave Scott and Mark Allen. And I was like, ah, I just, I, I, I'm gonna stick to the shorter stuff. Mm. But you did compete at Kona and were oh, first out of the oh. water. <laughs> Listen. You might've gotten past I, quickly uh, thereafter, but yeah. you, you, you got that TV time. Yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, I competed in Kona just because you have to. I mean, back then, if you, I wanted to do it, it's the granddaddy of all Ironmans. It's the reason I got into the sport. I saw Dave Scott in 1981 or two on Wide World of Sports. And I was like, oh my God, this guy is a stallion. Uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna do this. And uh, I did it. I was, I was first out of the water. I, I led until like almost a turnaround at Javi. Mm -hmm. and, and then got past. Oh, that. that's good. You, 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 so you led oh. for the first half of the bike. Oh yeah. 
Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I was passed by, that year it was Dave Scott, then Greg Welch, Ken Gla, mm -hmm. right? And then I came off to like 224. <laughs> the, the monkey jumped on, or I should uh -huh. say the piano jumped on my back. And then I finished like a thousand, like, you know, 54. I mean, it was painful That's just hilarious. being vertical. I mean, I, I walked a mile, ran a mile. I was like, oh my gosh. And so my, you know, two to three hour training days and having one or done one or 200 mile rides followed by a 10 mile run, <laughs> didn't not, do it. Not the best prep for no, that race. No, no. Didn't matter what I was eating. <laughs> yeah. So you did, so you were pro triathlete for 10 years? 10 years, exactly. Yeah. But then, then I continued to compete at a world-class level, but not in so much the road triathlons, but in the off-road triathlon. So oh, the, Xterra. the Xterra races, which I just gobbled up and I loved it. And it was so it was so different than the road triathlons where you just kind of put your head down and just cranked it out. Mm. Here, you know, mountain biking, you've got to be like on your game. There's just so much going on. I love the off-road running, the trail running. I love the the loop uh, course of the swim. Yeah. So all all that, and I so I did every every one of the Xterra World Championships on Maui for from 1999 to almost 2006, mm. and quietly plant based the whole time before it was a thing. I was yep yep for sure. I mean, you um, had to be the only athlete. Well, keep in mind keep in mind that, and I don't know what's happened to Dave you know, lately, but Dave Scott inspired me because he was 100% vegetarian and he was so hardcore, he'd, you know, he'd wash his cottage cheese and right. things like that to, to rinse off the excessive fat. Um, but it I was like- changed his tune yeah, lately. Yeah, yeah, I haven't talked to Dave about that, but- But hmm. while he was in top form, yeah, that was his approach. Yeah. And yeah. he was vocal about it hmm. at the time, as I recall. Very vocal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in, let's see, 1997, I was like, okay, I've been gallivanting around the globe long enough, swimming, biking, and running. It's time for me to hang up the Speedo, hang up the, the Schwinn bike and the, you know, the Nike shoes. And, um, and that's when I decided to try my hand at firefighting, right? And I just love the fact that, cause you know, triathlons, it's kind of lonely, right? Mm -hmm. It's such an individual sport. And I loved the fact that as a firefighter, I, I'm part of a crew, I'm part of a team. This is my second family. We're going out and we are doing, we're helping people, we're saving lives. And we're doing that like 10 to 15 times a shift. And I love the fact that you never knew when that tone went off, what exactly you were gonna find when you got there. Whether right. it was a fire, whether it was somebody that had a, you know, heaven forbid, a heart attack, whether it was a gnarly car accident, investigate smoke, um, just, you know, gunshot, whatever, right? I would imagine that there were more heart attack type visits than there were houses on fire. And that probably was, I suspect, like impactful to see, you know, people suffering up close and personal in that way. Yeah, especially given kind of my knowledge and my education, uh, seeing all these people, because I'd say 75 to 80% of our call volume was uh, responding as emergency first responders, mm -hmm. um, paramedics to this absolute just dearth of medical calls. So lifting assistance calls, chest pain, heart attacks, uh, people whose blood sugars have gotten too low and they're you know on the verge of going into a diabetic coma um, and yeah, 80% were all related to, the, I, which I will say is just the standard American diet. Yeah. And it was super sad because I felt like, you know, taking every one of them aside and saying, hey, I got the answer for you here. <laughs> yeah. Well, the big inflection point for you amidst the firefighting career was this experiment that you ran with your crew, right? Right, right. This competitive group of dudes who are all trying to best each other in various ways. You kind of flip the script on that and challenge everybody to see who could lower their cholesterol the most in a given set time period. Exactly. Firefighters are very competitive. And so we always have these little bets to see like, like who can make the most free throws, you know, in the basketball court in the parking lot, uh, who can do the most pull-ups, push-ups, ping pong games. 
So we had a little bet to see who had the lowest cholesterol level. And we found out that one of our, my f- firefighting brothers had a cholesterol at 33 of 344. Mm. And so that was really the, the inflection point when we as a, as a crew decided we would get behind this firefighting brother and eat this way, basically in an act of solidarity to help this guy out. And so this was in 2003 and I challenged this one guy, JR, to do it not only at the firehouse, but also at home. So he was doing it 24 seven. And in, within 28 days, his cholesterol went down to 196. So 148 Pretty points. Pretty dramatic, yeah. You're right, and that's in less than a month. Lost 14 pounds, sleeping better, acid reflux went away, you know, the, the standard protocol. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, um, and then the next thing you know, this is becoming a tradition at Fire Station 2 on the sea shift uh, The Austin American Statesman does an article about us. Then the New York Times, you know, the, 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 the crown jewel of written media does a front page article on the Metro section. And then I'm getting blasted by literary agents and publishing houses right. to write a book about the escapades and the adventures that we were having at Fire Station 2, where we were doing something as crazy in the land of beef as eating you know, tofu and broccoli and steel cut oats and sweet potatoes and, and all that jazz. Did you have a sense, like a light bulb moment of like, oh, this is opening a door to a new path for me? Or were you just kind of responding to what was getting thrown at you at the time? No, forever I was just responding to what was being thrown. Uh, I had, you know, I, I tell this story, I don't know if I've told you, but, um, I probably got letters and emails and phone calls from 30 different publishing houses and literary agents soliciting me to write a book. And I never responded to any of them. Cause oh I, my God. no, I was like, yeah. I'm like, no, who am I? I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, uh-huh. I'm not a life coach. You know, I'm not a dietitian. I've got no business writing a book. And frankly, the thought of writing a book was very intimidating. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, super scary. And um, at some point, and I'd say it's probably six months after the barrage started coming in, I just was like thinking, you know what? Well, why not? And maybe I, maybe I can reach a segment of the population that wouldn't otherwise hear this message from a doctor or a dietitian or your typical, your typical you know, kind of authority figure. Mm-hmm. And so I flew to New York and uh, you know, met with all these literary agents, Richard Pine, who mm-hmm. we, we've, we've talked about and uh, who was behind the South Beach diet and oh God, a, a litany of other uh, books. And I decided to go with him as my literary agent. And I uh, spent almost two years writing the book, right. doing a pilot study and all that. I know there was some debate or discussion like this pressure to put the word diet on the cover, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you were yeah. resistant to. Yeah, I didn't want to, but they insisted that that be on there. They also insisted that in the recipe section, you also have to have fish and chicken as an option for oh, people. Did they really? Because in 2009, like, when I wrote this, they're like, this is not gonna sell if right. it's 100%. That's so interesting. Vegan. Yeah. And you can, as you know, and now in, in subsequent editions of the Engine 2 diet, <laughs> we have removed right. all the, the fish. Oh, so the original edition had those in there. It as. For people that wanted it as an option, we had some, Uh, but it was only a couple of the recipes, mm -hmm. but I felt tainted doing it. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But the book goes on to become a New York Times bestseller, which had to be surreal for you. And it really does like create this opportunity and this platform to step into this sort of call to service in terms of like, okay, I now have this, situation in which I can really apply what I've learned to help the many that are suffering in various ways. And what's so beautiful about what unfolded, and we talked about this the last time, is that it becomes this extraordinary family story. Like everybody in your family participates in what was, you know, hence created to basically, you know, convey all of this wisdom from your father and your mother and your siblings, et cetera that has gone on to impact like, you know, millions of people. Yeah. Listen, this has been this has been such a gift, right? Ac- across the board. And uh 
I just feel so blessed and lucky that, you know, I've, what, what I've tried to do in, in my life is just always follow what I'm passionate about. And that is kind of um, served me very well. So when everybody told me, oh my God, you need to get a real job. Well, you can't just do triathlons. That's mm-hmm. ridiculous. I was like, listen, just like, let me figure it out. And I did that for a decade. And then I became a firefighter and loved being a firefighter. But then after I wrote this book, The Engine 2 Diet, and we haven't talked about this yet, um, the universe you know, kind of opened up, the clouds parted, and I got this invitation to become a healthy eating kind of crusader of sorts for Whole Food Market stores. Mm-hmm. And John Mackey, he read, he read the book and he was like, Rip, I want you to come on board. I want you to educate our 100,000 team member base. I want you to you know, lecture to as many of our customers as you can, go around to the UK, Canada, the United States, visit all of our stores and do that. I also would love for you to be a uh, healthy eating immersion partner and we will pay for our sickest team members to go and learn from soup to nuts about this lifestyle. And so, I mean, it's, it's just crazy, the growth trajectory that I was thrust into right. uh, in the span of you know, writing the book, having it you know, hit February of 2009, and then getting this invitation to be a health eating partner with Whole Foods Market in really the summer of 2009. And then I retired from firefighting after 12 years. Right, almost reluctantly. Oh, yeah, very, very much so. But uh, you know, as John Mackey said, he's like, Rip, if you want to take helping people and saving lives to a whole nother level, and I know it's not easy, but you got to burn the ships, burn the ships, leave that career behind, and come on board here. Yeah, and not for nothing. But I remember back in those early days, there were certain prominent figures in the movement who will remain unnamed who were of the opinion that it was impossible to make a living in in this kind of vein of advocacy like you can write a book that's fine or you can you know try to help people but ostensibly you're going to need another job right because there was no roadmap or blueprint for what you created no i i just i well i can tell you this that I wasn't gonna jump from firefighting unless I had something that was a little bit more yeah. you know, solid. And what John Mackey offered me at Whole Foods was uh, more than I was making yeah. as a firefighter. Right, it was, right. it was pretty secure. So you end up going on tour. I mean, you must've done thousands of these presentations at all these Whole Food markets well, all over the place. I, well, I went around for t- a decade and I probably uh, did close to 200 a year. <laughs> right, oh my God. <laughs> but you know what? Every time that I would get in front of that audience, whether it was three people or 300, I gave them everything I had, Mm -hmm. you know, because they were there, they wanted to be educated and uh, the opportunity to to turn, you know, help somebody out and flip them from the standard American diet to eating a whole food plant strong diet. Um, and, And I've gotten so many thank yous and just, you know, whether, and you know this, but when I'm doing book signings, like, you know, thank you, you saved my life. Thank you, you and your father saved my life. You and your family saved my life. And then, as you know, by John Mackey giving me this opportunity, I also, in addition to running these healthy eating immersion programs that we were doing for seven days, we then opened them up to the public. And then it also gave me the confidence to start doing these weekend events, mm-hmm. which we had you two. Mm-hmm. And the so- The plant stock and the various the, the plant retreats stocks. and immersions and- They've, they've, they've morphed, like they, are, they started out as kind of farms to forks. And then we decided uh, to call it plant stock. And, and yeah, we had those weekend, weekend events. And I think you came to three or four of them mm-hmm. over the course yeah, of Yeah, they're incredible. The years. They're incredible. So yeah. back to this point of, <laughs> of like traveling all over and doing 200 of these things a year, beyond the fact that it helped you become this extraordinary public speaker because you were so honed in on your message, other than like the thank yous and et cetera, like what are some of the things you learned about 
how to impact people in the most meaningful way. Like I'm sure themes recur, like, oh, I know when I see these people, this is kind of the basic story that they tell. How do you help them? And like, what are the things that you learn from meeting so many people who were struggling with their health? You, you know, um, I think that the thing that I learned more than anything was nobody is too far gone and that just about anybody can turn it around. And, you know, Dan Buettner talks about this a ton, but you have to create the right environment. So the healthy choice is the easy choice. That's a, that's a big one. And you gotta get rid of every one of the excuses that you're gonna throw out in front of yourself because everybody thinks that their excuse is better than anybody else's. Whether it's the mother that has seven children and is she just going nuts? Whether it's the CEO that is on the road 150 days a year, mm -hmm. whether it's the, the guy that works offshore on an oil rig um, and doesn't have access to food or, or an 18 wheel truck driver. And I say every one of those because I met every one of those uh, on my journey and every one of them was able to figure out ways of conquering it. Right, you don't know my, I understand what you're saying, Rip, that's great. You don't understand my right. specific problem. Yeah. My life's too complicated for this, thanks, but no thanks. Yep. Yep, and so we just got it. We just got to like clear the slate and say, listen, everybody thinks that, but you can do this. I believe in you. I absolutely know that you can do this, and let's just let's give it a try. And so that's the whole thing with the twenty-eight days or the seven days or whatever. You know, take it for a test drive, and then you be the judge after that. You know, is it something that you feel like was it worth it? How hard was it? And then we know that you need support and you need community. Right, so you don't feel like you're alone, especially over the, well, when I started this in 2010, there were hardly anybody, hardly anybody that was doing this. So we've created some really powerful communities uh, at Plant Strong, where people can feel connected to like-minded people. And we have coaches that are helping answer questions, but it's become kind of this, this community where everybody helps everybody else. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the and the, the original kind of portal for this was engine2.com that's now like evolved into plantstrong.com, but it's been cool to watch over the years how you're constantly iterating on the website and it just becomes a more and more robust 360 degree destination for all the resources that you need from meal planning to recipe prep to you know any number of dissertations or lectures on the whys behind all of this. And it really is for anybody who wants to learn more, like that's all you gotta do is go to your website and it's like all there. Yeah, yeah, plantstrong.com, we got, we got a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I tell you, I've, along the way, I've really developed such an amazing team of mission aligned people that work for me from, Amy Mackey, no relation to John Mackey, mm -hmm. Lori Cordowich, and then of course this whole new team that I have now. Sorry to interrupt the flow, we'll be right back with more awesome. But first, I do wanna snag a quick moment to talk about something I care a lot about, which is the importance of nutrition. And the thing is, most people I know actually aspire to eat better, to incorporate more whole plants, fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily regimen. Sadly, however, without the proper tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. And so, because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly, and because I want everyone to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. And the solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of customizable, super delicious, easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery. You get access to our team of amazing nutrition coaches seven days a week and many, many other amazing features. To kickstart your health intentions this new year, we're offering you $20 off a one-year membership with the code POWER20 throughout the entire month of January. Again, that's promo code POWER20 for $20 off at meals.richroll.com. All right, back to the pod. With the new year, with January upon us, most of us are thinking about changes we'd like to make, about 
sort of unlocking a better version of ourselves. It's new year, new you time. So I wanna explore that a little bit, but as a kind of preface for that or to contextualize it all, like make the case for a plant-based diet, like why a plant-based diet? Why not a Mediterranean diet? Why not a plant forward diet? Why not a carnivore diet or you know any number of the diets that are kind of swirling around in people's consciousnesses as they're trying to decide like what to latch onto. Yeah, there's a lot of noise out there right now. And um, I would encourage you not to go down another, not to go on another fool's errand because there's a lot out there. Um, and you said plant-based, I'm gonna take it even a step farther than that and say whole food plant-based because we now know that just plant-based isn't enough. And in 2021, there is a litany of products that are on the shelves right now. But as our friend Jeff Novick would say, they're loaded with crap, mm -hmm. right? Calorie rich and processed. It's almost like harder, like in the early days, it was hard because you didn't know what to do. There weren't a lot of resources and there weren't a lot of products at the grocery store. Now there's too many products and it's very easy to delude yourself in, into this idea that you're eating healthy because they don't contain animal products, but it's become more incumbent upon everybody to really responsibly read these labels and to make sure that you're not going down some crazy processed food rabbit hole that really is no better than the standard American diet and the processed foods that are, you know, kind of part and parcel of that lifestyle. No, I, I actually would, would tell you that, um, so, I have a podcast too, yeah. right? for, yes. for the listeners that don't know this. And it's called the Plant Strong Podcast. And I've been doing it about three years. And yesterday I interviewed Kim Williams. Mm -hmm. I know you've had Kim mm -hmm. on maybe once or twice. Once. Yeah, yeah once great. or twice. And, and, uh, and for people that don't know, he's the, well, he's the head of cardiology at Rush University Medical Center. He also in 2015 to 16 was the president of the American College of Cardiologists. And he said that eating a highly processed vegan diet is actually as unhealthy or more unhealthy than eating a animal-based diet. And he cited a study that was in the Journal of the American College of Cardiologists in 2017. And, you know, I came on board Whole Foods in 2000 late 2009, 2010. And one of the things that John Mackey tasked me with doing was doing a line of food products called Engine 2 Plant Strong because of the 20 or 30,000 different products around Whole Food shelves, there were maybe 50 that John could eat, right? Right, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, he's and, very diligent and hardcore. Hardcore, right? And so he loved the criteria that we had at engine two, as far as being 100% whole grain, low sodium or no added sodium, no added sugars or minimal sugars, low fat, 100% um, uh, plant-based. And so he said, Rip, you know, in conjunction with the Whole Foods team, let's start rolling out some engine two products. We'll license this from you. And uh, let's see if, you know, what we can do. And um, looking back now, this was so easy for me because I was just really a passenger, you know? I mean, I, it was a licensing arrangement. I had access to the whole Whole Foods infrastructure from the lawyers, the graphic designers, the food scientists, um, you know, they were doing all the travel to the manufacturers and making sure that they passed all the quality control tests and all these things. And I was just basically saying, you know, testing it and saying, yep, I like it or nope, mm -hmm. that's not gonna, not gonna work. Right. But kind of going back to your original question. So to me, it is so easy to get swayed into this mistress of plant-based foods, which, hey, I've had them, right? They're absolutely delicious. But if you are making these the foundation of you know, how you're eating, uh, that, that, that's a bit of a problem. Right. right, so then maybe define whole food plant-based. 
Yeah. And let's like build upon that and then talk about why that's optimal. Yep. So whole food plant-based is when you're eating foods as close to grown as possible that are minimally processed. And the one thing I left out earlier is we also, we're not doing any added oils, any processed oils. So for example, you know, if we were to, if we were to pick up one of our, our products, you'd recognize just about every ingredient in there. Jasmine rice, roasted red bell peppers, onions, ginger, uh, turmeric, okay? It's not gonna be pea protein isolates, soy protein concentrates, uh, coconut oil, safflower oil. Uh, and what you find typically in all these plant-based products that are littering the shelves right now is they don't have any whole food ingredients. It's all oils, sugars, salts, and plant-based proteins. Mm -hmm. And you know, our friend Colin Campbell, he's like, the whole is always better than the sum of the parts. And when you're eating whole foods, an apple, an orange, a mango, brown rice, you are getting this symphony of fiber, water, phytonutrients, antioxidants, protein, carbohydrates, fats, just the way nature intended. And that is gonna make you the best rich roll, the best Rip Esselstyn, the healthiest version of ourselves. Mm. So I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit sure. right now. But so what happened is Amazon basically acquired Whole Foods in 2017-ish and the world kind of shifted from underneath my feet and the whole Whole Foods culture for the most part. And all of a sudden they had a little different philosophy and, and know that Engine 2, it was a control brand of Whole Foods. So Whole Foods owned it. Right, it was a licensing deal yes. for you, yes. with you. Yes, and so uh, in like 2019, I kind of got word that they're just gonna be focusing in on the Whole Foods premium brand and the 365 everyday value brand. Mm -hmm. But it was such an experiment in trying to figure out and understand what products resonated with customers and which ones didn't. And Engine too, the most important thing was we're following the criteria. Right, no added oils. You know the sodium's got to be, you know, in this one-to-one -one ratio, which I can talk to you about in a sec. Um, and so we didn't put as much of a uh, emphasis on the taste factor. And so uh, in about 2019, when I, I basically they told me that you know we will not be renewing the engine two license for another 10 years but this is a great opportunity for you to now basically take the brand and, and do what you want with it mm. and, and give it the love and the attention that it rightly deserves. Right. And so I'm like, all right, am I like good to go? And am I done? Or is this like my opportunity to like step up and try and make this thing fly? Right. And the next year was one of the most challenging and soul searching years of my life. <laughs> so there's great pain on your face <laughs> as you say that. Well, it's true, it's true. Yeah, because <laughs> the overwhelming nature of what it actually means to like create, you know, from an entrepreneurial point of view, like oh. create your own business in the food space. And I, I had an idea how hard food was, right? I had an idea, but keep in mind at Whole Foods, I didn't get my hands mm -hmm. too dirty, right? Mm -hmm. I was above all that. You had to have learned a ton oh. about how it all works though. I mean, you couldn't have done this sure. when John first came to you. Like that licensing opportunity allowed you to have an education without having to, you know, so much as scrape your knees along the way. Absolutely. But it's the difference between being a passenger and being a pilot. And now mm -hmm. I'm forced to fly the plane. Right. Right. And I am I'm forced, <laughs> I'm forced to find the money. And I self-funded this thing for the first almost, you know, 12, 15 months. Wow. Right. At some point I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. Um, but I Rich, here's the thing. It's like I saw this also as a challenge that I just needed to go for. I needed mm -hmm. to go for it because I wanted to be, everything we're talking about right now, I wanted to be that lighthouse for all those other brands that are out there that you know what? 
this movement needs to continue to evolve. And we need a brand that's kind of like the Tesla mm-hmm. of automobiles. It's like the Tesla for the plant-based space. I mean, back when we did engine two at Whole Foods in 2010, we were 10 years ahead of our time. There was no other brand that I know of that was 100% plant-based, no other. There were some you know, plant-based products, but not a brand that was fully committed to this. And so I see, I mean, I would wake up at three going, oh my gosh, you've got to make this work. Do you have the stomach for this? Yes, you do. And every day it was like another challenge, another obstacle, like, all right, I got to hire somebody. Mm -hmm. All right, let's let's do a seed round. Let's Mm. find angel investors. You know, I had a great lunch with John Mackey and he said, Rip, what you want to do is you want to find people that love you, that adore you and believe in you and let them know exactly what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And I put together, you know, spent a long time putting together this pitch deck, was able to get 26 friends and family to basically you know, jump in, was able to meet with a category manager at Whole Foods. So people can't see, but I'm holding this broth up to you. Right. This was our organic vegetable stock. It's actually no added sodium. There's, there's let me just take a quick peek here. There's 20 milligrams of sodium per serving in this, you won't find another commercialized veggie broth that's less than probably 120. And most of them are 500 to 700. Yeah, it's a huge difference. Huge difference. So this is a category that is just littered with sodium. The same thing with soups and and chilies and stews. But uh, so I had to like earn my way back into Whole Foods. Wow. Starting from zero. After all of that. After all that. Did, when the licensing deal ended, Obviously, I mean, Whole Foods has rights to those formulations. Were they permissive in allowing you to use the same recipes and rebrand them as your own? Or did you have to come up with new things out of whole cloth? Uh, th- there were only a couple products that we des- decided to go forward with and I had permission to use those yeah. formulas. So was the yeah. vegetable stock your best seller? Cause I would have thought the Rips Big Bowl, would have, <laughs> my dad loves it. He's like, I'm eating my Rips Big Bowl. He's, you know, like he's not even like a plant-based guy, like, but he yeah. loves his Rips Big Bowl. <laughs> um, but so I got, I got this hope that, okay, this category manager wants like more. So I got to work, I hired a, a, a woman to help with food. Um, basically food development and, you know, kind of help create this. I hired a guy, you know, Ken Rubin from the Ruby Cooking School. Mm-mm. Oh yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, I think I do. I anyway, do anyway things, yeah. I've hired him as uh-huh. a consultant to help because one of the things when I took this brand over and I pivoted from Engine 2 to Plant Strong, and that's really important. I want people to understand that I love Engine 2. It's right, it's, it's always like, <laughs> it's, it's tattooed onto my heart. But it's kind of it's kind of a muddy name, and mm-hmm. you you have to let customers know what it is, what it does, and what it stands for, in about half a second. And so, Plant Strong, I decided to pivot to Plant Strong as the name, and you can see the new packaging. I mean, you know, yeah. it's it's really it's really gorgeous. It's clear immediately what it is, what it's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, you know, you can see the, the ingredients that are in the products. I love the new logo. And, and how many SKUs of the new line are there right now? So, I mean, there's lots of stuff up here on the there, shelves. There are, but so there's different channels that you can go into, right, with food. And you have to do it very strategically. So at retail, we're starting at Whole Foods. Whole Foods has asked for a 90 day exclusive. That exclusive period runs out November 1st. So starting November 1st, we're gonna go out into other retailers like Sprouts, like Wegmans, Rayleigh's, you know, a lot of the natural food channels. And then when we have our sea legs, we'll also go into some of the more conventional channels mm-hmm. like the, um, the, the targets. Um, what's the one down in uh, Florida that's so- uh, Piggly Wiggly? <laughs> Big, Walmart? The, yeah, well, Walmart's one, um, but um, yeah. Ralph's Fawn, Safeway, the, all that, whatever, the big ones. The big ones, yeah. the, the, the big ones. And, um, but I, I got some really good advice from a guy here in Austin named Clayton Christopher, who's just like got the, got the green thumb when it comes to CPG. He said, rip inch wide, mile deep, 
inch wide, mile deep in retail. Mm -hmm. And the reason why Engine 2 was able to do that at Whole Foods is because when you're a private label brand, you can do that if you're just in that store. But when you're trying to go out into thousands of doors, you gotta be more strategic. So we took the best seller and then we're doing line extensions. So we're doing, uh, on, the, on the broths, we're doing our, basically the same one. We're doing the vegetable broth. We're also doing a shiitake mushroom broth. We're also doing a Spanish style sofrito broth. And lastly, we're doing a sweet corn broth. So we got four right now mm -hmm. that are on the shelf and they're all like low sodium, no added sugar, unsalted, oil-free. And this is a category, like, like I said earlier, it's ripe with added oils, added sugars, you know, enough sodium to sink a ship. And so we've done a lot of research into making sure that these are top notch, they're fantastic, they taste fantastic, just to enhance and elevate all your cooking. Whether like I made some, just a stir fry the other day, I used the sweet corn, it was insane. If you're just doing like steamed greens, just put some of this broth in there, right. casseroles, you name it. Uh, it's amazing what a good broth can do for you. And then the other thing is we used to have an engine to firehouse chili. It was a three bean chili. And so we decided, and that sold really, really well. So we got the firehouse chili. We've got a creamy white bean chili, uh -huh. which you can see right here. And this has got like hatch green chilies in it. Um, it's got navy beans, cannellini beans, all the aromatics, so the shallots, the onions, the garlic. Um, and it's got about 220 milligrams of sodium in it per serving. And most of your like chilies and stews and soups have 500 to 700. And, and you know, the Institute of Medicine has basically said the top level for Americans should be about 1500 milligrams, 1500. So if you're doing like a typical, I'll just throw out a name, Amy soup, it's 750 milligrams. Is it that high? Per serving. There's two in a, in a little you know, can or Tetra pack. Right. That you, you've already met your upper limit just on that soup. Wow. Right. And uh, so considering that we got almost a quarter of America that is now hypertensive or on some sort of medication for this, this is a huge dietary need state for, to me, these kinds uh, of products. Um, we've also got a Indian lentil stew right here that is just like, it's like the equivalent, it's a kitchari, which in India is like a chicken noodle kind of soup. And it's so great for an upset stomach. Um, it's got black cumin in it, jasmine rice, red lentils, yellow lentils. I mean, every ingredient that goes into every product, we put a ton of thought into. We have a Thai carrot chickpea stew that's got lemongrass, kefir leaves, galangal, um, turmeric, you know, cause we want that curcumin mm -hmm. um, mixed with the black pepper, the piperin and the curcumin. It's like a one, two punch of antioxidants. So I really think of this as food as medicine. And you can see, I'm getting pretty wound up here, Yeah, but, but it's like- I like how a, excited you are talking about all this stuff. But there's like nobody, nobody, is doing this. And, and, and so what we wanna be is, again, I'm gonna say it, we wanna be that lighthouse. And the nexus of health meets taste, to me, there's nobody else that is doing it like we are right yeah. now. Yeah, I imagine, look, any entrepreneur is trying to build a business, you're not only facing obstacles, but you're compelled to have to face the possibility of making compromises. Like everything's a compromise. There is no ultimate, like, yeah, you could do it this way, but then you're gonna have to do this. Or if you do it this way, it's gonna cost too much. Or you can use this packaging, but this is gonna happen. Like every decision has all of these kind of downstream ramifications. I just know this from, you know, Julie's experience with her cheese company and all of that. Um, so to create a line of products that are kind of holding that, you know, apex aspirational space of we're not compromising on what these ingredients are. I'm sure along the way you had people saying, well, if you wanna do that, like, you know, it's gonna be hard, no one's done that or whatever um, is well, an achievement and cool. Well, that's really, and I'm glad you said that because what a lot of companies do is they'll just procure existing products and then throw their, la their, mm -hmm. their label on it. 
And so one of the most challenging things that we have discovered is finding a manufacturer that is willing to think outside the proverbial box using our requirements because, you know, it is I'll really- I'll tell you, we don't do it that way. Well, well yeah. And if, if you, you wanna work with us, you gotta do it this way. And if you, it, so yeah, we'll have to go knock on another door. Mm -hmm. And then the amount of time that it takes for us to get it just right, like the Thai carrot chickpea stew, we went through 28 different iterations before we actually got it to where we were like, this is it, home run. And there's also, you have minimum order quantities. So they're, like, they're not gonna play and yes, you're, unless you're willing to do, I'll just give you an example, 50,000 units Right, right of each one of these, and then you have to do the math and say when you're bootstrapping this. Oh, I mean, you know, with the term, the payment terms, and all of that, like it's got to be suffocating. Oh, <laughs> it's like this. Oh, no. We were talking about you were telling me like, oh yeah, I listened to the Matt Walker episode about sleep. Like I, I was like, oh, okay, this guy hasn't been sleeping. You know, trying to create this company. Well, typically I don't have a hard time sleeping. Right. My head hits the pillow and I'm asleep within a minute. But yeah, I've had too many nights, more than I care to remember where I'm waking up at 2.45, three, and um, I'm thinking about, okay, how are we gonna solve this? You know, how, you know, how are we gonna do this? Um, but yeah, I mean, you got 50,000 minimum, you know, a minimum order quantity. And it's like, okay, we gotta sell this many, you know, per week. Can we make that happen? And the other thing I was gonna tell you is there's different channels. So. The retail channel is one and it's a hugely popular channel, but it is so bloody expensive and mm -hmm. there's so many hurdles. And lots and, of middlemen all taking their little vig. Lots of middlemen, you got the supply chain, you got distribution that you need to work out, warehousing, you got to make sure that you don't have voids on shelf. I mean, it's endless, it's absolutely endless. The other channel, that has really been lit on fire, especially after COVID. DTC. D to C, right? Yeah. Direct to the consumer, Shopify, e-commerce. And so we, about a year ago, we started an, an e-commerce site for, for Plant Strong. It's plantstrongfoods.com. And this is a funny story. So there were these two young whippersnappers out of Miami. They were, um, ex semi-professional soccer players. And they'd heard the engine two message back when they were playing soccer. And so they started eating this way. And they're both like 33, 34 right now. And they, they have a business where they help you build websites and help you figure out customer acquisition and data analytics and all that jazz. But I didn't know that at the time. The reason why I reached out to them is they have a little passion project on the side and it's called Plant Athletic. And they basically make, they make, they make all this vegan wear, yeah, right? I know these guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Cameron and Daniel, Yeah. right? And so they were making these Plant Strong t-shirts. And I'm like, hey, these guys can't be making these. I've got, you know, right. I got the IP you, on that. Yeah, <laughs> you, you trademarked that day one. <laughs> I did. Yeah. And so, reached out to them and said, hey guys, love you're doing, love everything, but you can't be doing that. And they're like, hey, you know, are you actually like Rip Esselstyn, like from Engine 2? <laughs> and they're like, hey, is there any way that, you know, we can like work together and like, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, let's talk. So they flew to mm -hmm. Austin. And again, I had no idea that they, what their real, you know, expertise was. And we never even like, we, talked about the t-shirts. We just started talking about what they do and how they can help us out. So long and short of it is, I've got these two guys in Miami that have an amazing background in e-commerce that are now part of the team. And I, we call them Miami Vice. <laughs> That's yeah. their nickname because they're two good looking studs, young families. And they're responsible now for you know, building the website, helping us figure out you know, how to bundle it, uh, how much promotions do we have to do to, you know, to keep moving the product. Um, and it is a, it's been a dream working with That's these cool. guys. Plus they make unbelievable cycling kits. Yeah, they, yeah. It's like the best stuff. I love their stuff. Good. I'm so good. if you wanna rock the message when you're on your bike, like check these guys out, Plant Athletic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, like, and, and in that channel, 
right? That's where we, we, we took some of the best sellers at Whole Foods that we're not gonna do at retail, but we're like enthusiastically doing an, on e-commerce, like the Rips Big Bowl. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I mean, when I think you have all this experience with Whole Foods, so you kind of understand that, but the economics of that ain't great. And you have this incredible community of people that you've yeah. built over many, many years who are passionate about you, your message, they wanna hear from you. They're, gonna, they're ready to you know, go wherever you wanna lead them. To me, DTC just seems like the best way to go. I would, I mean, you should even do, maybe you're already doing this, I don't know, but like a subscription model where it's like every month, you know you're gonna get your box of all the stuff. You get that recurring revenue stream and it just allows you to be more connected to this community that you've created. Yeah, no, we're, we're on the subscription. Yeah, okay, that's, that's definitely smart. Yeah. You know, there's, we got hundreds of people that are subscribing. They need their Rips Big Bowl. Your father should get on that subscription yeah, I know. actually. I'll, I'll get him on it. I'll, 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 that's a Christmas uh, gift, I'll, I'll buy him a subscription. I'll hook him up, <laughs> I'll hook him up. But, but uh, yeah, so we took our best sellers. So we got like the Rips Big Bowl and we added back the banana walnut that was my mm. favorite. Um, and we now, and we've actually taken it and we've, we've upgraded everything. So we're now using organic oats, right? Got it you gotta be organic, especially with the oats and the glyphosate that are out there right now. We've totally like upped our inclusions. So the dates are like, they're like date marshmallows. They just kind of melt in your mouth. The, uh, the dried banana, you know, no added oils, no added sugar. It's just literally dried banana. Like you ever had the banana bar? Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's, it's like amazing. And then the, the, the berries, the, um, the raisins, everything just, just rocks. And then we, we, we started these granolas because we had granolas back in the day, but we decided to up our game in the granolas. And so we've got an all American apple pie. We've got a classic oatmeal raisin cookie. Um, we've got a berry crumble and, um, oh, we have a tahini chocolate chip cookie as well. Yeah. So, uh, and, and and the thing that make these so unique is there's no added oils, there's no added sugars. Instead we're using- Yeah, most granola, there's so much sugar in so, those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're using, we're using macerated dates. So it's just the whole date. So you have all the fiber, all the you know, nutrition that comes with it. And then also apples mm -hmm. as well, right? Um, so one of the big things with the new plant strong is we're looking for ways always to elevate the taste without compromising the health of it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you just have to get innovative and, and, and you can make it work. And, and the thing is, and I'm going back to your original question, you know, 30 minutes ago, the, all these plant-based brands is they're using all the tricks. They're using all the excessive amounts of sodium. They're using all the excessive amounts of sugar. You look on the ingredient deck and I guarantee you there's three to four different types of sugar that are in that ingredient label. There's probably three or four different types of oil and uh, all these things, they're using the typical tricks and, um, and not using whole food ingredients. Yeah. And well, kinda, sugar, salt, and fat. I mean, that's how you create well, palatability. Right, and so it, if you strip that away, you're challenged you, to create something that's gonna taste good, that's gonna appeal like you were speaking earlier about like taste, like if it doesn't taste good, man, like yeah. you're, you're dead in the water, right? So short of salt, sugar, and fat, like coming up with a formulation that is gonna appeal to people, that has to be primary. And, and, and where I was gonna go and I, I, I spaced out, so I forgot, uh -huh. was most Americans' palates have become so hyper palatized, right? Because of all the excess amounts of salt, sugar, and fat. And if you read, have you ever had David Kessler or Michael Moss on your podcast? No, but I know Michael Moss's okay. book. Yeah, so know. he wrote yeah. Salt, Sugar, salt fat. sugar, Fat. Yeah. David Kessler wrote The End of Overeating. He's the former head of the Food and Drug Administration. And both of them basically talk about how these companies put salt on top of sugar, on top of fat, and then they put more salt on top of sugar, right. on top of fat. And they have, you know, millions of dollars to test these things to create the, the absolute point. peak of palatability to hook you and create this addictive compulsive response with these foods. And that creates a population of people who have this hyper palatability issue where yes. when they actually eat real food, it doesn't taste good because they're so accustomed to these processed foods 
that are designed to taste good and to trigger that addictive response, but ultimately are what's leading us down this path towards chronic illness yep. and obesity and everything else. Yeah, and and so, you know, we, we've got our we've got our work cut out for us, um, but on the e-commerce side of things, we're we're going to create a, a master brand where right now we've only got nine products on there. Actually, I should say we got seventeen. But our goal is to have 50 by the end of 2022. So it's like, it's basically, it's a store mm -hmm. where you can come and you can buy everything, you, not everything, but a lot of what you need to make this lifestyle work, especially if you're looking for that convenience and you can know that that plant strong, when you see plant strong, it is the good housekeeping seal of approval right. that this guy, <laughs> you don't have to read the, you don't have to turn uh -huh. it over. You don't have to look at the nutritional facts lab, label, look at the ingredients, this guy, is good to go. So here we are in January. <laughs> yeah. You still have to sell me on this idea, Rip. What? Why a plant strong diet? Like, why can't I have some chicken and fish? What's wrong with some olive oil? Like, why do I have to walk this path? Like, what is it about this lifestyle, this way of eating that makes it superior, that is gonna allow me to sidestep these chronic illnesses that have felled half my family and affected my friends? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna answer that in a number of different ways. The first is I'm not gonna come at it as being superior, although it is, right? If you're looking for optimal health, but you see the shirt I'm wearing right now? Eat strong food. Eat strong food. So I tell people, if you wanna eat strong food, this is the direction you wanna go in. You wanna eat a whole food plant-based diet as close to, eating foods as close to grown as possible, where you know you're getting the most kick-ass form of protein, right? All proteins originate from plants. Most people don't know that, right? And it's like the Goldilocks form of protein. It's not too high in the sulfuric containing amino acids. They're gonna promote inflammation, leach calcium from your bones, raise cholesterol levels, basically burden the dickens out of your kidneys and your liver, right? So. That's one thing. You got the best form of protein as opposed to the protein that you're gonna find in red meat, chicken, fish, any, any of those, those, those meats. Um, you know, Dr. McDougall, mm -hmm. he loves to say that anything that flaps a wing, wiggles a fin, paws a hoof, or closes a clam, inside there, you've got these substances, these insidious substances like cholesterol, like saturated fat, like problematic animal protein. You just can't get away from it. Whereas you look at the strong foods, the, the whole plants, you got Goldilocks protein, you got the number one form of carbohydrates that are gonna fuel our 37 trillion cells. You and I are both comprised of about 37 trillion cells. And what fuels us is, it's glucose, it's sugar, right? Unless we're trying to do something like go on the keto or the carnivore, and, and now we're trying to fuel ourselves with you know ketones and, and basically fat, which don't recommend to anyone. And, um, and then when it comes to uh, fat, you're getting the essential polyunsaturated fatty acids that we so, as human beings, we so desperately need. And the reason why it's called essential is because our bodies cannot manufacture these on their own. We have to get them from food. And most Americans rich are getting 35 to 50% of their calories from fat, and it's the wrong kind of fat. It's the fat that's coming, it's saturated fat that you're gonna find in chicken, in eggs, in red meat, all those kind of things. So you're avoiding all those things. But the thing that I'm gonna like harp on right now, and this is pretty, pretty new. And have you ever had Will Bolshewitz on your show? Yes. Okay. It's the microbiome, right? We now know that one of the most powerful things that you can do to create a like rock solid immune system to help like mitigate all those cravings for bad food is to start eating a whole food plant-based diet. And now the 10 times the number of cells that we have of bacteria that reside in our microbiome, we're creating a healthy microbiome and it is gonna help us defend against the litany of chronic Western diseases that are out there, inflammation, all these things. 
and um, Kim Williams, who I was interviewing yesterday, as far as like why, you know, why should I eat plant strong? So Kim, and again, he's on my mind because I interviewed him yesterday. But I asked him, I said, what are you doing, Kim, to like motivate your patients after they've had a stent or a bypass or a procedure? And he said, you know, Rip, I have I found this motivational interviewing technique. I discovered it in January of 2019. And it works almost every time, like a charm. And I'm like, tell me, <laughs> I wanna know. And he said, okay. So I walk into the room and I let him know that I am Kim Williams. I'm the head of cardiology here. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a couple really silly questions. First question is, what's your understanding of why you ended up here and needed a stent or bypass? And he said, they'll say, well, I, I had a blocked artery. I, I, that's my understanding. And he'll say, right. And what was it clogged with? And he said, 90% of the time they'll say plaque. And he'll say, exactly. And do you know what was that plaque made of? And he said, most of the time they'll say, well, cholesterol and fat. And then he'll say, well, where did that come from? And they'll say, well, I ate it. And then he'll say, and what foods have that saturated fat, have that cholesterol? And if you wanna to continue to eat that way, know that I will be here, Rush University Medical Center will be here with our 51 cardiologists to play surgical whack-a-mole, right? And we'll put in another stent, we'll do another bypass. Or if you decide you wanna eat plant-based, you probably never have to see us again. But he said, just the fact of getting that coming out of their, their mouths and connecting the dots is super powerful. I think it's cool that, you know, he, what I hear in that is, he's giving the patient agency. Like rather, you, yeah, we're yeah. used to like the doctor coming in and saying, this is the way it is and this is why you're here and here's what you need to do and then goodbye. As opposed to a line of questions that then compels the patient to think, it gives them sort of power over those decisions and leads them towards the conclusion that ultimately he wants them to arrive at. Exactly right. Yeah. And now they're, they're a participant as opposed to being lectured at, exactly. Right, right, right. Where they're just gonna tune out and go do whatever they're gonna do. Yep, Yeah. yep. So, I mean, frankly, for health reasons, whole food plant-based, that's like the pinnacle. That's where you wanna be headed. But I mean, as we started, I think said in the very beginning of this, you know, we got this climate crisis that's afoot right now. And, um, you know, from everything that I've read and you know, we're already over 400 parts per million when it comes to the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is, I guess, very, very scary. By 2050, mid-century, I think the goal of this COP26 meeting is to become net zero and to keep that 1.5 degrees Celsius from getting up that high. And I read like, what are they asking countries to come to the table with as far as what they can do to kind of reach these goals of being net zero by mid-century and making sure we don't increase our temperature by 1.5 degrees Celsius. And these are the four things they've asked. Accelerate the phase out of coal, curtail deforestation, speed up the switch to electric vehicles and encourage investment in renewable energies. Nowhere there do I see anything about eating a plant-based diet. That's insane because by all accounts, every acclaimed climate scientist understands that there's no way we can achieve those benchmarks without reducing the global demand for meat. And when you talk about deforestation, we're deforesting to clear land for grazing and raising crops for animal feed. There's just no way around achieving our aims unless we adopt a more plant-centric diet and get off the teat of our animal food addiction. Yeah. And you know, um, 
Khaled bin Alawid, mm -hmm. you know, one of the Saudi Arabian princes. Uh, he has basically said that it is his goal in our lifetime to relegate animal agriculture to the bin of basically history. And he's created this whole venture fund yeah, and, yeah. and has placed, you know, large uh, investments in all of these companies and startups that are moving our world in that direction. Sell your meat, all that stuff. But here's where I, I, I wanna take this to the next level. And that is almost all of us have seen Cowspiracy, right? Where, you know, Kip Anderson talks about how he found this report by the World Watch Institute that's part of the World Bank called um, Livestock's Long Shadow. And in it, they talk about how between the supply chain and the life cycle of the close to 80 billion animals that we grow and then basically slaughter and then eat annually, 51% of global greenhouse gases are caused because of that, 51. And they also talk, the number that I see floating around a lot is 14 and 15%. It's the same as all forms of transportation combined. But I just heard six months ago, you ever heard of a guy named Selesh Rao? Yes, I've had him on the show. Oh, well, okay, yeah, yeah. okay, there you go. So Stanford, you know, the director of Climate Healers, basically he has new research showing that it's not 14% animal agriculture. It's not 14%, it's not 51%, it's 87% of global greenhouse gas emissions are caused by everything related to animal agriculture. How did he come up with that number? I'll, I'll, I'll send you the paper. I'll send you the paper. I, but I think again, it's between the supply chain, all the trucks, all the deforestation, you know, all the water resources, you name it, right? Um, but I mean, and so this is why I look at this and you know, the goals of this, this meeting in Glasgow in a couple of weeks, and that's not even on there. We gotta figure out a way to get this front and center. I mean, mm -hmm. Billie Eilish, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the number of celebrity people that are getting behind this message, right? Phoenix, um, Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin Phoenix. I, mean, the I think it's his birthday today. <laughs> Happy birthday. Have you ever Joaquin. had him on the show? No, I'd love to. Yeah. yeah. He does, he's not, you know, he's, he's a reclusive one, that guy. Yeah, yeah. So frankly, we're, we are in a bit of a pickle right now. And we need everybody that, that makes sense screaming from the mountaintops, hey, planet Earth, you gotta get plant-based like as fast as humanly possible. And this is why I am a fan of everything that's going on in the, this plant-based you know, food industry. If, if we can get people to eat this way, fantastic, because at least we'll have a mother earth in a hundred years or so, right? This plant strong, this is a whole nother kind of level of, of plant-based, it's the varsity program. And it's probably not for everyone, but anybody that wants to take their health to the next level, this, this is it. But I am such a fan of, of what's going on right now. I know you were here meeting with a company called Daring, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, And I just, the innovation that's going into this industry, the rate at which it's growing, a couple facts. 2014, Global Data, which is this research firm, did this research and they showed that 1% of US American citizens identified as vegan, 1%. 2017, three years later, 6% of US citizens now identified as vegan. That's an increase of 600%. Wow. And imagine what it is now in 2021. Mm -hmm. I, I, I bet you we're getting close to that you know, that tipping point of 10%. Yeah. And I mean, I see laundry detergent now that's claiming plant-based, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's also a lot of like greenwashing out there. It's like, oh, we need to be on board. This is like the thing that we need to be associated with. How can we do that? Well, we'll change the, the ink color on our labeling to green. There's a lot of that, but yeah. that just means that this is in the culture and in the sensibility and people understand that they need to align with the plant-based sensibility in consumer products if you wanna be competitive in our capitalist society, which is all told a good thing. Yes, 
the Plant Strong line, like where you're coming from yeah. is the varsity program. And, you know, it's important to remind people like, look, you know, I, I'm like a flick the switch guy. Like I'm gonna, you know, cross that line and not look back. I know you're the same way. Most people rip, I got news for you. They don't really function that way. I wish they did. <laughs> we gotta ease people into this and any changes that you can make in a positive direction are awesome. I mean, you mentioned Dr. B earlier, Will, Will, Will Bolshevitz. Bolshevitz. Yeah. You know, when I got interested in this, it was very much from a personal health perspective and perhaps a vanity perspective. I was fat, I felt like shit. I saw those before and after angiograms that are in your dad's book. It's profound. You see the reversal. You're like, wow, just eat plants and you can go from A to B on this. Like that is unbelievable. Like, and it just, it got like branded into my brain. But now we have all these other on-ramps for people that are interested in making changes. So perhaps you're not worried about heart disease or perhaps you're not worried about diabetes. Yeah. A lot of people are, that's a good reason to consider this lifestyle. But maybe you have an autoimmune disease or you have some kind of inflammation that you can't get on top of. Dr. Will Bolsowitz will tell you that the best way to begin to address that is by increasing the diversity of plants in your diet. Like that's his whole thing. It's about the diversity. He wants you, know? you to get, he wants you to get yeah. 30, 30 different uh, I know, every week. Right, like that's a challenge. You want a challenge? Yeah. Take that challenge on. That's not so hard. It's not telling you you can't do X, Y, or Z. And it's not focused on the things you're not eating. It's about like, how can you get 30 different types of plants down your noggin every single day? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And I love that. Well, well, and now we have this environmental issue. You know, when I began this journey, I don't know about you, like I wasn't thinking about that at all. Now I think about that all the time. It's, it's so powerful. And I think everybody is thinking more deeply about how to live more sustainably and more gently on this planet. And when you look at the numbers, and you kind of really sit with everything that you just shared, Rip, you can't get around the fact that pivoting towards a plant-based world is really um, a crucial aspect of this solution. You know, it's, um, it's mandatory, it's mandatory. And things have, like, things have changed so much for me over the last 10 years. Like you, I've got kids now, I've got three kids and you can't help but think about their future, right? And then their kids. And the fact that these guys are talking about, you know, climate change and, you know, we, we had last February, Rich, we had, you probably heard about, we had Snowgeddon here in mm -hmm. Austin, Texas. We haven't had, a, I mean, I've been here 30, almost 40 years, 39 years. We had snow for, three days, we had freezing temperatures for almost four or five days. We had the electricity off on our house. We had no water. It was downright frightening. And most people don't have four wheel drive vehicles. I had a friend, you know, Rick Kent, mm -hmm. who was in his apartment. Uh, and I basically took my life in my hands in my little car and got him. And he came and stayed with us because he was in his apartment that was 37 degrees for three days. And I was like, can't, I, dude, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're wow. gonna die. You know, things like that. And then of course, you know, the fact, the fact that, you know, we're, we're having the hottest year, you know, ever. And it seems like every year is the hottest year mm -hmm. ever. Um, it is, it's, it's staring us right in the face and it is, it is downright scary. How old are your kids now? So I got a set, <laughs> thank you for asking. Yeah. I, uh, I, so I, I got married late in life. Uh -huh. uh, I was 40, almost 44 when I yeah, got married. You had your Peter Pan thing going <laughs> on for a while. I, big time, <laughs> <laughs> big time. But, uh, and I married a wonderful, wonderful woman. Oh my gosh. Um, but I got a seven year old daughter named Hope and Hope is an absolute firecracker. Um, and then I've got a 12 year old daughter named Sophie and Sophie is like an old soul. She is so like cool, calm, collect. She, you know, keeps us in check. <laughs> yeah. It's just crazy. And, and then I've, I've got a son, Cole, who's, who's 14, much more like me. And he's like all about athletics and swimming and sports right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you had any challenges with them 
deciding like, hey, you know, cause look, when you're a parent, like nothing you do is cool. Like, you know, they like, I don't know what your experience has been, but like my kids, like, they're like trying to figure out how to define themselves in opposition, right? right so right. they're like, <laughs> yeah, I know you do that stupid thing over there, but like I'm going over here because they're trying to figure out who they are, right? And part of that is great and natural. They have to ex- experience life on their own terms and push the envelope and figure out where the guardrails are and all of that. Um, when it comes to the foods that they're eating, like, you know, I, I mean, I mean, my kids have never had meat, but they go off and like do whatever they're gonna do, right? And all you can do is like, this is the way we eat here, educate them about the hows and the whys behind it. And then on some level, I mean, my kids are older than yours, like you have to like let go a little bit. Mm-hmm. So you're just on the precipice of like the, the hormone storm that's about <laughs> to descend upon no. you know, these kids. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out, I, but I, are they like all on board with you right now on all this stuff? Rich, I, I couldn't be luckier. They are wow. so on board. And I think that, I think it's kind of like how I was with my father. I was just like, I just admired him and respected him so mm. much. And just seeing you know, him put his shoulder to the grindstone and, and do things that people said were impossible to do. And I think my kids, you know, they've been to, they've been and they've seen me talk they, at, at Whole Foods. They've seen what I do. They, you know, they see all the, Plant Strong Engine Two products littered throughout the house. They, they see me, you know, doing the podcast. They see how how hard you know Daddy works, and so I haven't gotten. There, there's been no pushback with the food. Yeah. And actually, if anything, they wear it with a kind of badge of honor, like really proudly. Um, but I mean, that's cool. But they, but they, uh, you know, they'll, you know, we've got the um, Natamu, you know, ice cream in mm-hmm. the freezer and, you know, they're going after that. And, you know, um, the Mary's gone crackers and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, and they'll go to birthday parties and they'll have the, the birthday cake. And we typically will bring our own vegan cupcakes or stuff like that, but no, no real pushback. And the thing is, Rich, I don't know about you with your kids, I just try, I try and shower them with as much love as I can. Um, And my daughters, I heard a quote from a guy, uh, his name's actually Dale Hayden. He was a triathlon buddy of mine, but he told me this in like 1988 and I never forgot it. And he said, you know, Rip, a woman's beauty is her father's love for her shining through her eyes. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. Oh my God. And I was like, I mean, you can see I'm getting goosebumps right now. And I was like, when I have children, if I have any daughters, I am going to let them know how much I absolutely adore them, how much I love them. And I don't want to ever clip their wings, you know? I want them to continue to just be bright, burning suns. And uh, so, you know, I say, I love you. We do that in our family so much. And when I was growing up, we didn't do that a lot, mm-hmm. you know? And so I, we really err on, on doing that, being affectionate, holding hands, all that stuff. With my son, Cole, you know, it's a little different relationship in that, you know, I, I'm a little harder on him and my wife has to rein me in a lot mm-hmm. and say, hey, you're being much harder on Cole than you ever yeah, have Yeah, but been. dads and daughters, it's like, you know, <laughs> just like the be a softy, you know? <laughs> I know what that's like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but anyway, having kids has been just one of the greatest experience of my uh-huh. life. It's one of the hardest things. It's one of the most gratifying things. It, it's just incredible. And and anyway, just you know, to try and connect all this a little bit, because you and I, and you know, I think a lot of people on your podcast, we don't shy away from doing hard things, right? And there's a certain joy and and gratitude that comes with tackling hard things and conquering it and then moving on. And I'll just say it again. I've never experienced anything as challenging or as hard as as this right here, Mm. right? As launching this food line. Yeah, you're pointing, like you don't mean parenting, (laughs) you mean like launching the food line. Now I'm talking about the food line and and parenting is is right there, It's, it's, it's the same. And also, you know, making sure that relationship with my wife 
right, is yeah. is, is is solid because it's so easy to get off base. And when I was traveling, you know, a hundred days a year and all that, I don't know how you did that? No, it it. Uh, I looking back, I can't believe it either. Um, so this, if I can conquer this, if I can over the next ten years, you know, be a lighthouse for other brands and really further the whole whole food plant-based movement, not the plant-based movement, but the whole food plant-based movement, then I will have been mm. successful. And I just gotta be authentic to what I started back in 2009 and what this brand stands for. We have spoken for <laughs> over an hour and a half and not yet have <laughs> we brought up the fact what? that you set a world record in the 200 meter backstroke <laughs> at age 56. You know, and that was- In the 55 to 59. And that was, and that was really stupid of me. Why? Because I didn't, I should have done it when I was 55. Oh, right, because you're at the bottom of your age group, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What could you have done at 55? Exactly. I know. What did you get? You went like 220? 220.8. 220. 220. Well, well, actually, so talking about hard things, right? So uh, some guy challenged me. He said, hey, Rip, you know, there's a meet uh, at, ASC, the, the pool that you swam at. Uh huh. It's a long course meet, so you get a world record. You know, why don't you go for it? And it was two weeks away, and I hadn't swum in a long course meter pool in a couple of years. But I figured, okay, I'll give it a shot. And do you do you want to hear the story? I, I do. I, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, the reason I bring it up, yeah, other yeah. than like I want to celebrate the fact that you broke a world record because it's totally badass. But I think in the back of people's minds, it's important for people to connect the dots on your athletic experience because when you talk about all things plant-based, you think about like, well, how am I gonna, how am I gonna be able to be robust? How am I gonna be able to go out and like be active and do the kind of things that that I like to do? Is a plant-based diet going to sustain me? And you at age 56, breaking the world record in the 200 meter backstroke, like it's Fucking cool, man. And I, so I do want to hear the story. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the record was a two twenty two point seven. Who held it? Um, you know, I can't remember like his name. Somebody like, like Rick Carey or something. No, like that? no. Come on. I don't think Rick's been in a pool uh-huh. pool since. Uh, I don't know. LA. I don't follow it. No. But Krazelberg. <laughs> no, he's not that old. Yeah. No, he's, he's not. not old he's, enough. He's not. So. I went and I missed it by over two and a half seconds. Uh-huh. So I went like a two, almost 224.9 or 225 low. And I can remember, I knew I had to take it out in about a 109, 110. I was out in a 111, came back into like a 13. And I had somebody on the deck holding up his fingers like what I was, cause I figured I'd be an eight, nine. Well, he held up both hands signaling that I was like a 110 or mm-hmm. above. And I can tell you, Rich, that second 100 meters, my stomach got tied up in knots. My legs felt like they there was cement being poured into them. I was breathing like a freight train. And I was like, why am I doing this to myself? What do I gotta prove to anybody? So I finished, I didn't get it. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. That is, whoever set that record, good for you, you stud, right? Uh-huh. And then that night I was going to bed and I'm like, I got this gnawing, you know? I'm like, yeah. God dang it. All the right. Competitive rip. firefighter is I'm, rearing its head. Oh, I'm like, okay, Rip, think about it. Why didn't you get it? Well, you haven't been in a 50 meter pool. As a swimmer, you know, it's almost a different animal completely. Yeah. I mean, long course, I mean, it's, forget about it. Oh, it, it, you, you, you ain't getting away with nothing. There's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide. And so uh, I, I did my homework and I found another meet that was gonna be in at the dad's club in, in mm. Houston, Texas. Wow, that's taking three way we- back. In three weeks. The dad's club, that's still a thing? <laughs> it's still a thing. And the pool is like three feet deep, you know? And I'm like, but it was the only meet in the next three weeks that I could drive to. And then we were going on vacation for a month. So I went to, a different master's program because I knew I needed to swim in long course. So I went to the ASC pool. Mm-hmm. I trained for like two and a half weeks there. I woke up at 5.30, had the PTSD going. But you had been trained, like you're 
avid oh. master swimmer. So you were like going to work out all the, it wasn't like, oh, I'm, I'm going, just, I'm right. going five days a week yards. But again, meters, so I, and I did all kinds of race pace stuff. I made sure my stroke was a little bit longer. I saved my, my legs for the second 50. And so I got to that meet in the dad's club and I was, I felt comfortable in meters again. And again, I had somebody on the deck, hold up your fingers, let me know, am I, am I out in a 108, 109? I see two, two hands again. 110. One, one, actually, it was a one, 111, but she didn't have, she couldn't do anything. And so I'm like, okay, 110, oh my God, the re, I gotta bring it back in a 112, right? That's yeah, what I'm thinking it, in my for head. For people to, under, I mean, you're essentially <laughs> even splitting even your splitting. back. Even. Like at, at any age, that's yeah. very difficult, <laughs> let and, alone. And so I started like, all right, let's dig in, let's do it. And my stomach didn't, you know, go up in knots. My legs felt good. My turnover was solid. The last 50, I like cranked it up. And I was like, yeah. And I touched the wall, 221.8. So I got the record by nine tenths. Mm. And I was out in a 111.5 and I came back in a 110 something. So I negative split. Negative split. split. Negative split it, right? Yeah, so, I mean, for people that don't fall, understand swimming, I mean, that never, that's well, extremely difficult and almost never happens. Yeah, yeah. And so then I went on vacation for a month in to Wisconsin, this little you know rustic cabin on the lake to unwind. And I swam every day for 20 minutes. And I decided that I would just do some interval stuff in the lake where I go a minute, a minute hard, minute easy. And I came back here and I got an invitation from the, this woman that ran that meet at the dad's club. She was running a meet at Texas A&M. This is an indoor 50 meter pool. It was like the districts of masters swimming. And as opposed to at the dad's club in the 200 meter backstroke heat, I was next to an 88 year old woman <laughs> and, a, and a 40 year yeah. old like, you know, guy. Uh -huh. There were three of us in the heat, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> and so I lapped, I lapped the 88 year old oh, woman or whatever. God bless her. But God bless her is right. But at this, there were nine heats of men and I was in the last heat next to a 22 year old uh, dude who was in at a 219. Uh -huh. Right, and I was in at 221. So we went out together and I was, I was out in a 109, like flat. And I felt the month on vacation, the second 100. Yeah, but only swimming 20 minutes a day. Yeah, yeah, but I, but I went a 220.8. Mm -hmm. So I lowered my old record by a second. And it was all because of this guy that was next to me. I beat him by a 10th and it hurt so bad. But um, he must have been bummed. <laughs> he, he looked over he, and he's he, like, "This dude." No, he, I think he was a little bit dismayed for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, all that Goldilocks protein. Yeah, yeah. He, he, Gold, he, thank you, Goldilocks protein. And now I got people asking me because you know I'm going to be 59 in you know four months. Hey, you going to go for the 60 the to 60, 60 yeah. 64? And you know, I probably will have to, but. <laughs> mm, what's the record in the next stage group? Do you know? I think it's a 226. It's pretty soft. Right, right. Right. Soft record sitting there with your name on it. Got a cherry pick it. Yeah, but you never went to like Masters Worlds or Masters, not, cause there's bigger meets, yeah. right? You go to these and, and they're always in, like the Worlds is always in some really cool yep. city. Yep. Halfway across you know, the world. I would do it, but now that I'm married, I've got three kids. Yeah. It's like, how much time do I wanna spend right. doing that? And so the fact that I could do everything that I did and it was all driving distance, so it just was a Saturday. Yeah, like the, the A&M meet, I woke up at <laughs> six, was home by noon. I think it's powerful because it demonstrates not only can you still perform at your age at a very high level, the ripple effects of that, like there was a lot, like a lot of news picked that up, like it got reported on and it becomes this narrative of like, not only can you be a competitive athlete as, as a plant-based person, but the longevity piece also, I yeah. think is really important. And, 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 then, and then truth be told, Rich, I got that record in the first one in June, the second one, I think in August of 2019. And I knew that the Game Changers was coming out Right, right. Yeah, it'd be good for the movie and all that. Yeah, and because I was one of the executive producers, and because I had you know a small little little piece in it, um, I just I wanted to like let people know you can still be like in your fifties, forties, fifties, sixties, and like 
be like at the top of the world, you know? Yeah, and not for nothing. Like I still got it, man. <laughs> and I, but Just I, in case you were questioning, and I still got, I got, still got some juice. <laughs> and I can remember, I think when I was on your podcast for the first time and I told you that I was gonna go for a world record and you, you, you said, I can't remember what you said exactly. I'll have to go back and look, but you were like, dude, you can do this. And right, you, about time. You, you, you got this. And anyway, so yeah, about time. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I, I just think, like, I think about this a lot too. Like, I don't have the time to train the way that I was training when I was doing all those ultra distance things. Like, I wake up and I think, what's the best use of the limited amount of time and energy that I have? Like, how can I use what I have to impact the most number of people in the most meaningful way? And Usually that means doing exactly what we're doing right now or working on a book or going and speaking somewhere. Every once in a while, I think it does, there is merit and value in investing that time and energy in the, into something athletic because it demonstrates that vitality. Like you can talk about all this stuff all you want, but ultimately, as you know, and as Game Changers was so important in advancing, like people, watch what people do. And mm -hmm. when people go out in the world and they execute at a high level, that is gonna lodge into their brains and in their consciousness in a way that's much more important than the latest study that you retweet or whatever else it is. It's like, that's how people learn. It's not necessarily, like you were talking about, it's about education. Yes, yeah. it is. But how do people learn? Like what's the best way to impact people in a way that's gonna move the needle? And I think storytelling is mm. a huge piece and you know, doing something hard, you were talking about like, yeah, yeah, we like to do, like when you go out and you do something hard and you succeed, that is a powerful story that people don't forget. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at so many of the people that you've had on your podcast, you know, from Colin. Oh, Brady. Oh, Brady yeah. to Jesse Itzler. And you know, they're just doing all these crazy, crazy feats. And, I, and, and I'm at a, I feel like I'm at a point in my life now where I'm excited for them, but I, 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 right. can't, I, I can't wrap my, it. I personally can't wrap my head around it, you know, climbing Everest or doing the last man standing event, you know, doing right. this loop. Do you no. know Harvey Lewis? Dude, I, I, I'm trying to have him on my podcast. Yeah, I'm but, getting, yeah. I'm ju I just got a date to schedule him on to have him come so on. So did he win that thing? He, not only he won it, he, he did more, they call it yard or is it, yeah, I think it's a yard. Like when you, yeah. when you a loop, like a four mile loop, I think they call it a yard and he did more than anybody ever has. Was it three days or three and a half? Was something like that. Like, I don't know the exact stats, but he he just ran an insane, and, well, and it's like, he he did like, he was going ultra after ultra after ultra leading up to this. It's not like yeah. he hadn't done anything. Like he just did a couple huge races earlier this year. Well, but here's the thing that's mine. Plant-based, we should point out. I mean, that's right. one of the reasons we're bringing him up. Like, but, but one of the things that's mind blowing to me is that, I think these guys were up pushing each other for three or four days right. in a row. And Matthew Walker is gonna have a stroke, right? When, when, he, when he thinks about that. <laughs> these guys don't sleep at all. No, but I mean, I think in the, the podcast with you, he said how, you know, you go five, six days, you're looking at death and permanent, like, you know, disability mm -hmm. mentally. I mean, whoa. Right. <laughs> there is, a, there is a, a moment in your life where, you know, you wanna stretch prove what you're capable of, do the thing. And then there's a twilight on that. Like you've proved everything that you need to prove to yourself. You've established your bona fides as a, <laughs> you know, a, a virulent you know, athlete who can perform at a high level on a plant-based diet. Do you really need to invest more time and energy to double down on a case you've already made? Yeah, yeah. That's really the question, right? Yeah. I mean, when you, when you I mean, would, would you ever entertain doing like another Ultraman or something like that? Or does it make you just sick to the stomach? I mean, it doesn't make me, I love it. Like left to my own devices, like I love to train. Like if I had nothing to do, I would just like yesterday I ran and then I went to, you know, I went over to Barton Springs and I swear, I was like, what else can I do today? Like, can I get on one of those boats out there and paddle around? Like I just enjoy it. So I don't think of it as burdensome, but to place that kind of rigorous training schedule template on top of my life right now, like it would be impossible. And I don't feel like there's that much more for me to say in that space that I haven't already said to yeah. myself that would 
that would justify that amount of time commitment to do that thing. That's kind of how I look at it. But I like doing hard things and I wanna stay you know, challenged by tackling things that scare me from time to time. I think that's important as well. Yeah, like I look at um, like Scott Jurek, for example, right? Who got the Appalachian mm-hmm. Trail record. And then just recently he went for it again, had an issue with his knee and had to you know, drop out. But I'm like, wow, Scott, man, you, 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 Ah, oh, because I read his book North, and yeah. and you know he basically by the end of that he was mincemeat. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was absolute mincemeat. Yeah, I mean, he'd lost so much weight. He <laughs> looked like you know another day of that might oh. have done him in. I mean, it was unbelievable un- what he achieved. Un- unbelievable. But uh, again, I I applaud people that are getting out there, getting after it, pushing the boundaries. I mean, wow, yeah. right. And now there's a whole new generation of people. They can do it for us, right? That's right. That's you right. We I mean? can we can we can be on the sidelines yeah. cheering them on. So wait, so you're 55. You just turned 55. I just turned 55. Yeah. How's that I feel? Did. I feel. I mean, I feel good. I feel fine. You know, I think when I turned 50, I didn't think twice about it. I think when I turned 52, like the white hair started coming in really fast, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like yeah. this is different. Um, 55, you're rounding towards 60. So I think that one landed a little bit harder. I don't know how it's been for you, but you know. Well, I ain't not spring chicken anymore, but you know, I get out and I get after it and I'm able to, I wake up grateful every day that I feel good in my body and I can go out and, you know, be active. I got some back stuff and, you know, I'm not immune from little things here and there that are bugging me that didn't used to, but, you know. No, I, one of the things I've learned is no, nobody likes to really hear anybody complain about aches and pains that they have. It's just, it's kind of like a big yawner, right? right. And you try and empathize with them. But I, I, I had something happen to me. And it was one of the reasons why last year was one of the most difficult of my life. And, you know, in addition to trying to launch this Plant Strong brand. And that is, I was on a mountain bike ride behind my house. And That's right, I forgot <laughs> this thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I've been mountain biking for 30 years. And I'm like gumby, you know, I fall and you know, I'm I'm like, okay. Took this fall and oh my gosh, I, I mean I, I heard a snap. I got nauseous in my stomach. I tried standing up, I fell back down on the ground. I basically snapped my fibula. Um, and so I broke my ankle. I had to be car- carried out from of the green belt, and I had surgery about a week later and I had uh, a, a plate and eight pins put on. Mm-hmm. I didn't walk for almost five months, you know, hobbling around on crutches or a, a little, you know, scooter. It, it gave me such respect and empathy for people that are handicapped, that people have any issues, you know, with, with being ambulatory, things like that. I'm, I'm looking now for the handicapped, you know, stalls, the handicapped, you know, rampways, you know, all that stuff. Mm, that's and, rough, man, five months. I didn't realize. Oh, five months. Five months. Five months. And I still I still have some issues and I wanna have the plate and the pins taken out because I can, just never feels quite right. Mm. And I haven't really, I mean, I run, but not like I used to. You out on the bike at all though, or are you just hitting the pool? No, can no, you no, get, no, no, you're no. done. I, I know, no, I'm biking. Oh, oh you are, okay. I got back on that horse. Yeah. And it it was scary the first week or so, and and the trails here have you have you run on the green sure. belt at all? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of like corollary trails that run off the main green belt, and that's where the excitement is, like and, more like single track stuff, single track ledges, roots, rocks. I mean, it it's gnarly stuff. You have to have some skills, and uh, so getting back on the bike was the first week was was rough. And then I got back, but I'm always now a little bit more tentative than I yeah. was before. Yeah, yeah, it's unavoidable, man. But I'm glad you're back in one piece. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it feels good to be back. And you know, I, I just now, uh, just walking, I'm like, oh, thank you, I, I'm so grateful. <laughs> yeah. But it made, it made me think of you know our our friend Paul de Gelder and mm. what that man went through and his spirit and his tenacity. It's unbelievable. His just, the manner in which he carries himself with such gratitude and poise is remarkable. I just saw him a couple of weeks ago. I mean, you know, for people that don't know, 
victim of a bull shark attack in Sydney Harbor, lost half his leg and half of one arm. And, you know, I mean, but has become this incredible ambassador for shark preservation, for ecological, you know, responsibility and so many things. It's such a powerful voice. And he goes into the gym and he kills it and just <laughs> no excuses, no woe is me whatsoever, just like walks the talk. Big time. And he's now like the the, the host of Shark Week on the I Discovery know. Channel. I mean it's like a full time job. They got him flying all over the place all the time. Yeah. And doing stuff with, cool. with like Mike Tyson. I know. And yeah. He gets to see people like Mike Tyson and Will Smith basically, you know, poop their pants. Right. <laughs> I know. It's hilarious, man. <laughs> Um, we're not gonna end this without leaving people with some takeaways who are you know, thinking about getting on the plant strong bandwagon. What do I do first? How do I make this switch? What do I watch out for? Help me, Rip, help me help them. <laughs> um, well, the first thing I would recommend is you gotta start somewhere. And I would just go to plantstrong.com and I would take the seven. There you go. I would take the seven-day challenge. L literally, anybody can do anything for seven days. So take take this challenge, and don't think of it as a, as a challenge. If you have a lot of challenges in your life, think of it as, as an adventure in healthy eating. And um, and what I always tell people is, just find foods that you love. And like do steel cut oats for, for breakfast with a sliced banana, maybe a little bit of oat milk on top. Um, do the commercialized Rips Big Bowl cereal, right? Just anything. You're a born marketer. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and then find a lunch that you can like gravitate to. Like in that ice box right now, I have got a, uh, a sweet potato, right? I've got frozen frozen rice. I've got a can of black beans. I got some salsa. I'll just throw that together. Um, I always have some green leafies during the day, preferably twice a day. But uh, my favorite dinner is always, and we had it last night, rice and beans extravaganza. Just brown rice, pinto beans, white beans, you name it. And then I do a veggie relish on top where it is sliced, sliced tomatoes, sliced uh, bell peppers, a little bit of avocado, water chestnuts, a little bit of tofu. This lifestyle, it is, I tell people, this is the cheapest, easiest way to eat once you kind of get over yourself and all the obstacles that you're putting in front of yourself. Um, again, I'm just gonna repeat really quickly. Oatmeal, potatoes, rice and beans. This is peasant food and it can be absolutely delicious depending upon what you put on top of it. I love putting sriracha mm -hmm. on a lot of my things. Uh, we go through so many bottles of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then I'll go back to the community. It's really important that you plug into a community and you're getting support through a community. And we've got all kinds of free stuff, uh, community.plantstrong.com with 25,000 people that are super active wow. and engaged that just, will be very welcoming and open you or welcome you with, with open arms. We've actually re-engaged with our um, medical immersion programs. Mm. So we did, a, we did our first one in two years because of COVID right. in, back in Sedona two weeks ago. And we had 80 participants. Wow. We had the whole Plant Strong crew that was there. We had Dr. Michael Clapper. We had a guy named Dr. Brian Aspel, who's a rising cardiologist. I don't know him. Yeah, he's, he's a new guy on the block. He's amazing. Um, we had, of course, my, my sister, my brother-in-law. My parents did not make it to this one um, with, with COVID and everything like that. But we made sure it was safe. We, everybody had to bring a test result that they tested yeah. you know, negative. Uh, and so that was fantastic. We're doing another one of those in Black Mountain outside of Asheville, North Carolina in early March. If anybody's interested in learning from soup to nuts about the lifestyle and we do rich, we have bonfires at night, we have stargazing, right. we have talent show night. It is like, <laughs> it's like, it is like camp. It's like food camp for kids. And you learn to like find your inner child and laugh again and have so much fun. And, and I, I'm gonna deviate just for a sec because something really powerful happened in Sedona. And I wanna 
try it on for size with you. Mm. So one of the things we do at whenever we have a Sedona immersion is we have a big bonfire and it's, you know, the Sedona night sky is so spectacular. And we have this bonfire and we got all 80 people around it in chairs and it was cold. And we just invite people to tell ghost stories, right? And we typically have like 15 people that decide to share and almost all of them are true. And people will, will say how, you know what? Um, when I was a little girl, this is true. This, when I was a little girl, um, my mother had a best friend and she was beautiful and she was an artist and we really connected. And I would dream about her at night that we'd be doing things. And she would be dreaming as well about us doing things together. And then when we'd meet like in person, we talk about, oh, wasn't that fun when we did all this together? So they were visiting each other in their dreams. And she said how she, she's always had this ability to kind of really connect with people, read people. But as she's gotten older, she's kind of lost it, right? Another woman got up and talked about how she, when she was a little girl, there was this man, the cookie man, because he had this freshly made cookies in a cart and he would come by their house in the neighborhood and she'd always buy cookies from him. And then she had a dream one night that the cookie man died. And she found out the next morning from her mother that the cookie man had died. So she you know, somehow was able to tap, right. it, tap into that. Um, and it was like story and story again and again like that. And, and one of the stories that I told was one of my one of my wife's very good friends at a young age developed this ability to basically <laughs> visit the dead, right? And it sounds kind of crazy and far out and the listeners are probably- I'm going, all about this. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah, keep going. Okay, okay, okay. And, um, and she said when she was a little girl, what happened is um, something happened where her, her, her father died and she was alone and she was scared and this woman would come visit her at night and hold her hand. And this is starting at like, starting at age six. And this woman somehow gave her the ability to tap, go beyond that veil of this physical, like, you know, in reality that we're yeah. in and go beyond to be able to talk to, to dead people and I know this woman and I'm fascinated with her, and, but she doesn't let hardly anybody know about this skill that she has. So anyway, so this is happening at Sedona where, you know, we tell these ghost stories. And, and Sedona and being kind of like this <laughs> vortex yeah. for, you know, spiritual expansion and yeah. mystical experiences. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's story after story yeah. after story and everybody's like, God, if this wasn't true and this, you know, this couple was standing there you know, in their robes, and then I looked again, and they were gone. And you know, we we found out that in doing our research that seventy years ago the house burned down, and you know, this new one went up. And so you know, so we go to I'm I'm busy doing stuff, and I go down to the dining room at the retreat where mm -hmm. we're at in in Sedona, and I'm one of the last ones to go through. And I go outside, and I'm looking and there's one person all by themselves. And so I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go sit with this person and you know, make sure they're doing all right. And so I sit down and I said, is somebody sitting here? And they're like, no, help yourself. And I'm like, oh, I don't recognize you. And she's like, yeah, no, I, I work here and I work on in energy and meditation mm -hmm. and spirituality. Mm -hmm. And Rich, the next 30 minutes blew my mind because I just peppered her with question after question after question. And she like met me there, right? And I wanted to know what happens like, you know, after we die. And, you know, I told her about all these, these ghost stories and my, my wife's friend's ability to talk to the dead and, you know, all this stuff. And she said, you know, Rip, um, we're, all, we're all trying to figure it out in these physical, you know, bodies that we're in. And the most important relationship that you can have in your lifetime is with yourself. It's really with yourself. And I can't get too specific because it's a little too personal on some levels, but, but she said that um, you 
You pick your parents. You pick your parents based upon the lessons that you have to learn in this life that you're gonna live right now. And most of us, most of us have come back in this physical form or different physical forms on average 300 times. And I'm like, whoa, go. And then she said how, and if you can get in touch with your complete self in this lifetime, and it made me think of, you gotta do the work. You gotta do the meditation. You gotta like dive into the being, you know, that spiritual, like just energy and that, that force that's out there. If you can tap into it, she said, you then have the ability, once you die, that your energy has the ability to break through that veil and you are now free from this lower mm -hmm. dimension that we're in. I'm fascinated by all this. It blew my mind. And now I want to explore this like in a big major way. I, I <laughs> love it. I mean, this is like my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> and this podcast took a turn I was not <laughs> expecting. Cause I, I look at you and I'm like, Rip, yeah. Rip is a very practical, you know, grounded yeah. individual. He, he very much lives in the three dimensional world. And now we're talking about ghost stories and the karmic cycle and all of that. Like I, I, I just think like, regardless of your spiritual or religious proclivities, there's something very powerful about understanding that we're here for a reason and that there are lessons to be learned. Like we're here to grow, right? And so, yes, we choose our parents. Um, what can we learn from them? What are the obstacles that we faced? What are the traumas that we experienced? And what is the kernel of truth that needs to be explored through that. Like, and I look at my kids and I'm like, they're my teachers. They're putting right in front of me things that maybe I don't wanna look at in myself, yeah. right? And they're here to like teach me those things. And all of these experiences that we have are opportunities to go a little bit deeper inside, to mine that truth that is trying so desperately to you know hide from you, right? And the more that we can embrace that and be cognizant of that journey, I think it, it's just a beautiful way to, to live. Yeah, and she, and she looked at me and she's like, you know, cause she'd been there for 15 years teaching. And she said, you know, yeah, Rip, I, you know, I see you as the, you know, the engine two right. guy, but what I want you to know is you're so much more than that. And if you could take all that positive energy that you have and everything and really like explore, who are you? Who are you, Rip? Really, who are you? Well, if somebody were to ask me like, who is Rip? Like I see you as this incredible catalyst for positive change in others. Like you are a change agent and you stand in a certain set of life experiences with a strength and with a conviction and with this unbridled optimism that conducts like a frequency of energy that gets emanated out in the world and becomes like a, a magnetic field that's attracting people who are looking for something just a little bit better in their own lives and see you as a living example of something that they perhaps aspire to. And you're somebody who reaches out with this like welcome open hand and says, come on in the water's warm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love, I love ending every one of our immersion programs by basically saying, listen, you know, I want you all to know that the light will always be on and the door will always be ajar, right? So you're always, you're always welcome. That's a good place to land the plane for today, let, I think. Let, let's go get some plant strong grub. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I love you, man. I appreciate all the openness and the honesty today. Uh, and uh, and the you know spiritual rabbit hole that we just dove down. It's very cool. You feel okay? It's good. You hungry? I, I, I feel I feel great, and uh, I can always eat. Good. Yeah. So we're gonna go do that. In the meantime, uh, if you want to learn more about Rip, the best place to do that plantstrong.com. And if it's not already in your local grocery store, it's probably coming soon. The Plant Strong line of foods available nationwide. So. By the time this thing airs, it'll be available in Whole Foods, plantstrongfoods.com. And uh, we'll be starting to get into like sprouts and right. Wegmans and some of those, but just keep your eye out and do me a favor. 
when it, go into your retailer and say, hey, you need to get those plant strong there foods. You go. <laughs> there you go. Dispatching your army, your, your legions of minions out there yes. to seed the world with plant strong goodness. Seed, yes. All right, buddy. Um, to be continued next time you're out in LA. Thank you. Peace. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. I truly hope you enjoyed the conversation. To learn more about today's guest, including links and resources related to everything discussed today, visit the episode page at richroll.com.